Katie, do you think are we almost good to go? You think? Okay. Good evening, uh, and welcome to the first official talk of Beautiful Futures, our spring 2024 lecture series. The song you just heard a few minutes ago is by the English art rock band Everything Everything, who used artificial intelligence to generate that video, as well as all of the lyrics of that entire album. Artificial intelligence is a topic of intense debate and tremendous speculation. Some of it intense, like the debate, some of it idle. It is seizing the imaginations and a lot of the oxygen of the people around the world who are interested about the future of architecture. Now, uh, it's also seizing a lot of attention when it comes to the future of the education of architecture. This is one of the reasons why we have invited our present speaker to launch this lecture series. His name is Tim Fu, and if your architectural interests have been entangled with Instagram or Dezine, then you have probably already met him, or at least encountered him, and you probably remember him because his work leaves an impression. Fu is a Canadian-born, London-based designer renowned for his expertise in advanced computation and AI and architecture. Emerging from Zaha Hadid Architects, he founded Studio, Studio Tim Fu, a high-tech architectural practice pioneering the integration of AI into visionary designs. He is an alumnus of Toronto Metropolitan University and the Architectural Association in London, and he augments his design work as an adjunct professor and global educator leading workshops on computational design and speaking at conferences all over the world. He's, I mean, it's amazing he's still standing how many places he's been just in the past <laughs> 365 days. I'm not convinced he's not triplets. You're uh, the song. I wish. Um, <laughs> uh, all of these are good enough reasons for us to invite him to speak here at the Catholic University School of Architecture. But we had one or two more. First is the way in which his work defies easy stylistic stereotypes or predictable categorizations. Artificial intelligence may come to serve many purposes in architecture, but Tim is already showing us how it can help us brainstorm our way into new visions of technological texture and mode, tectonic prose, and naturalistic formal poetry, striking chords of both timeless beauty and cutting edge innovation that were perhaps hard to imagine before. His work defies the simple binaries of traditional and modern, organic and digital, rose petal and megabyte, and I feel new doorways, and perhaps very new and very lovely doorway frames and sidelights may be opening to all of us as a result. Please join me in welcoming Tim Fu. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel, and thanks for this invitation. Hello, everyone. This is the beginning of my first lecture throughout North America. So uh, it's a bit past midnight for me, technically, in London, but because I'm so excited to talk to you guys about all the interesting subjects, I am going to definitely be awake for this. So let's go right ahead if my clicker works. And <laughs> does that mean I need you to help click every time? No, works. But I think you need to be... Where do I point towards? Ah, okay, I have to kind of go behind the desk, okay. Yeah, we need AI for this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, again, the subject is burning my ear because we always hear it, AI, right? Every field, every industry is talking about it. This goes beyond architecture, guys. For all these industries now, we are starting to really... Uh, invest more time because there's so much subjects within the domain of AI itself that is kind of revolutionizing a lot of industries from large language model to data analysis to self-driving cars and automation. AI has been dominating the headlines in the past uh, couple of years. But most recently, I want to talk about AI in the creative domain because this is a subject that has gotten into mainstream conversation within the last two years or so, namely due to programs like Midjourney, DALI, and programs that start to bring AI into the creative domain, into the visual domain, and also into music, as uh, we've seen. So really, what is the capabilities today? You write a word, a guitar-shaped house by the coast, a sentence like that. And we would get 
something like that. It's a guitar, it's a villa, but it's fused together in a way that it makes sense. Unless you look at it too detailed. A beautiful timber structure on a lake. Same thing. Let's try something else. A suburban villa designed by Zaha Hadid. So is that the end of architecture? Do I just describe the architect that I want to be and it does it for me? Well, it's not quite so just yet. Now, this clicker is the biggest challenge of tonight. So I tricked you guys, right? That wasn't actually the text that I used. Start off, I put the same text here, a suburban villa designed by Zaha Hadid. This is actually what we would get today with the latest version of uh, Mid Journey. And when I look at this, usually for my students, I tell them, ha, this is the typical Mid Journey regurgitation. And uh, it's not representative of the style or the ethos at all of the office. So it takes at least a Mid Journey process. That one alone is a, a series of methodologies that I've developed over the last two years or so in order to get to where we want in design. When you type a huge series of texts, you got to test them out and you do so repeatedly, more so like trial and error. The way you place your text will change the results. The way you um, distance the rel relevant text towards each other, the way you cluster words, the, the semantics, everything will have an effect on your output. So in a way, it's almost like linguistic alchemy where you don't know exactly what you're getting, but you're cooking the crock pot. And in the end, you will land on something closer and closer. And within that, there is an understanding of how to craft a prompt in a way to get what you want. And once you get there, you still have to do a lot of other things. For example, you can vary the geometry globally or subtly, I would say. And these things get us from what we saw earlier to at least this point. And further on, we could also take individual areas and further refine. So you take the area, you type out what I want this particular corner to be smoothened out, or I want the stairs to be streamlined with the uh, balustrades or the interior. So this is already where we are with Midjourney alone, the level of control that we have. And within that level of control is where we find our own human artistic merit, right? Every technology has limitations and has its strengths. When everybody can do photorealistic images, it's no longer about that, the value, but it's about how you take this technology and push it towards your own processes in order to refine it in your own methodologies. So just as an example, that's the direct text on the left. And here is some prompt crafting on the right. And we can see the mirror in the human input, despite that it's a AI technology. So Zaha Deed, right? I worked there for a few years and it's more than just visuals, right? I know it's a controversial type of architectural style, but yeah. beyond formalism, there is a lot of intricacies within the domain of at least what we can call tectonic or parametricism. There is so much refinement in the geometries of understanding how you can sweep these curves in ways that will create beautiful interiors and allow for uh, ease of construction even. So I worked at Zaha Code, which is the computational research team. And within that, we worked on projects such as the Unicorn Island. Uh, it's a funny name, but this project has a lot of different towers and I jumped around. One of my specializations there was, uh, was to uh, specialize in the facade parametricization. So to get the odd and crazy geometries in order to be buildable, scalable, and uh, feasible and within budget while talking to a construction team the whole time. So my understanding of these type of Zaha-esque geometry is from a economic perspective, is from a logical perspective, like the curves and geometries do exist, but they also follow a sense of order. So with that background that I have while I was still working at Zaha Hadid about more than two years ago, AI started to happen. And at the very early stages, you know, we saw, for example, Mid Journey and its first results. This is the type of stuff that I would see. 
right? Nobody did this. I did this just with uh, version two or three. But like this is the type of work that was the first ones to come out. So while it excited me to think, oh, wow, this is a completely synthetic image. And it's, it was tagged designed by Zaha Hadid. And I was like, oh, it is like Zaha Hadid sort of, but not quite. So that's when I decided to jump on myself and give my first initial spin based on my background as a Hadid. So my first experiments were to just get some understanding of how the technology works and to collect uh, some of my best generations and to post it on Instagram. Like that's how I started. And uh, my goal remained the same from then to now, more or less, is to try to refine this technology and pursue that sort of design ethos, I could say it, or the excellence that you have, that you try to push a technology. So this is where we are today. It's only been less than two years from what we saw then to now. And for those of you that are well aware of the news, the video format, OpenAI Sora, see a lot of shaking heads. Yes, that's just mind blowing because the video is going even faster than AI images for some reason. But I mean, that is the big jump we have. So the technology advanced quite a lot. Also my methodology advanced while uh, exploring further and I have my set of prompt engineering skills. So I guess those things kind of resulted in the same design aesthetics I've been trying to pursue the whole time, but it's finally refined to a level where I think it's closer to closer to what I have in my mind. But the idea is to always have something superior in mind, right? You don't want to be the, the person that's being controlled by AI because everything you see is beautiful. You want to say it can be better. It can be much better. How do I refine it so that you take control of the AI and not the other, not the other way around. So that type of, um, language and design style, I try to explore with different materiality. Uh, here are some brick related geometries with um, various uh, colors and themes. So that's when I started teaching as well. Um, I have a, a lot of courses on parametric architecture for those of you interested. Usually every two months or so we do one, but uh, it's from there that I try to dispel and try to, uh, you know, abstract some of the ideas that come from uh, fluidity as a design style, because I think a lot of people do perceive it as just curves, which is not really that simple. And so within the domain of understanding curvature and how to generate them in ways that are rational, uh, they are drivers in creating the, you know, the overall diagram of some of the designs that I've done. And uh, even within that, there's ways to prompt out the different types of curvatures. Right now, I have a current uh, classification. I would call it the S-curve, the Z-curve, the more like the angular ones, the blob uh, that we're more familiar with. Sometimes it can be more ribbony or the classical curves of using straight lines and arcs. So there's a lot of ways to sort of categorize and understand curves. And for me, that's one of my... I guess my preferred languages of exploration and the sense of the future. Like I'm always exploring what I want to believe is the future and try to see different ways of designing that. So at some point, I also would like to include other elements, maybe elements in visual arts, maybe elements in classical architecture. Here is the uh, Great Wave, a uh, famous Japanese painting incorporated into a uh, hotel. So I like to take classical elements from different cultures. Here's Islamic architecture taken into a more contemporary style. And uh, of course, I explore from the Western to Middle Eastern to the Far East, all the different aesthetics and how that can be applied to a more contemporary architectural style that I speak to. And of course, if we go into like more Baroque-ish architecture, we can start talking about the bringing back of ornamentation the idea to celebrate maximalism again, because it's been so lost since modernism, I think. And we also revere the beauty of cathedrals and whatnot of old buildings that has more than 500 years of history, but why we're all building squares and simple straight lines and flat surfaces. So I have a conviction and a 
huge deep interest towards complexity, complexity in architecture and algorithms, and also complexity in expression. And so exploring that with a contemporary energy is very interesting, bringing back ornamentation. And so one of the projects that I did was to try to uh, break down some of these designs and see how we can actually build it. For example, I broke it down into a column capital, one of the most expressive ornamental pieces in architecture. And so after coming up with an idea that seems quite feasible to actually carve out, uh, I decided to 3D model that thing using, you know, just our own intuition and interpretation, bringing that into the digital space and then to the physical space by, uh, there's a collaboration with uh, by a gentleman named of, uh, Till Apfel, who is a very highly skilled stonemason in Germany. And during this collaboration, we worked through with AI design and him using his skills and hand carving actually brought this thing back brought it back to, um, brought it to reality. So it's an interesting concept because now it's, uh, you know, a completely AI generated concept, but human fabrication. And that's kind of like reversing the role of what industrial revolution was trying to do, which is human ideation followed by machine fabrication. Here, I wanted to do this sort of experiment to kind of showcase that while machine can ideate now, we can also bring back humans in the fabrication side. So it's not always about machine replacing humans in every sector. It's about where we want our human artistry to continue to progress while machine is taking over all the more so mundane type of task. So it's more of a concept on where we want to focus human energy. So this one was featured at Venice Biennale and also Bauhaus, travel quite a few places. Um. So all of which you've seen so far were done purely with Midjourney. That's the one on the left. And there's quite a plethora of tools now available and they each have their own advantages. So now I'm going to talk more about look X and stability, stable diffusion and control net. So with this series of uh, AI, you can start with an input image that unlocks a lot of potential. We go back architects, we go back to being children playing with bricks and we can see a resultant geometry and architecture formed out of that. Perhaps we can rethink the architectural process by crumbling a piece of paper and then prompting Frank Gehry to just in five seconds, Frank Gehryify something that was supposed to be trash. <laughs> and we do the same thing with Zaha Hadid or Daniel Libeskind. In the matter of seconds, we have all these tools in our fingertips to be able to explore. And at some point I wanted to try to figure out how to bring back more human element to it. So I decided to sketch it by hand. You know, I've been told we lost that human element of sketching by hand. So why don't we sketch by hand and then bring architecture to the realm of reality through your hand sketch in a way, reinstilling that human, human touch or alternatively, you get more inspirations from nature, beautiful morphologies you find that do follow certain patterns and algorithms of nature, for example, on a pine cone. And this pine cone can become a residential tower, for example, also in a matter of seconds. So it's all about the idea. So just last year, I left Zaha Hadid to start my office, Studio Tim Fu in the ambition that I really wanted to push AI as far as possible in the creative process, because I believe there's a lot of potential that is not being harnessed right now in the existing industry. And we have to kind of step back and perhaps reconfigure and think about where the human role is in this entire design process. And uh, AI can take over so many things already in the top of my head. The conceptualization phase for sure, as I've demonstrated, AI rendering is going to just become stronger and stronger. And we've seen some of that as well. I believe AI will have the day where it just completely takes over the BIM model, which then quantitative, not just qualitative, quantitative data can actually be controlled by a large language model, for example, something that will be able to calculate things for you while presenting to you the, the visuals 
And then from there, you go AI into detailing and documentation. All of those are not within, are not outside the grasp of AI, really, if you think about it. They're, they just haven't been realized yet. And we are kind of in different partitions trying to figure out how to advance each of those and then finally tie it all together in a single streamline. So technically, in a way, traditional architectural practice is somewhat like this more or less, right? We have the main design guys with their pyramid because it's very hierarchical. We have the specialized team, BIM team, sustainable team. And then I believe with AI, at the very least, we're gonna have a lot smaller team of in a design firm, but we will have specialists that are specializing in AI in each of those sectors. And that's currently my first blueprint in expanding my office more so, so that we think computer science, software engineers, and AI specialists, uh, database managers, BIM managers, these things are going to be a long-term career. So concept AI, again, we have Majourney. Design AI, I will call it because it's more so involved in the, you're more involved in the design process. This is the stability stuff that I've shown you. And then also, of course, there's refinement AIs that we've seen some at work, like generative fill, generative AI for upscaling as well, like Magnific or Crea. And the number keeps increasing. These tools keep uh, um, being developed and we're getting more and more choices by the day. By the day. Last last week, my mind was blown by, you know, by uh, OpenAI Sora. And that mind blown moment, I've been having it every quarter yearly now. It's just so much things going on today. So the traditional architectural process, right? Sketches was a plethora of things done by hand. And then you have the concept, you get into modeling to refine it, and then you refine it further and detail it in the model and in the plans. And I say now it's kind of like that still. It's not like we're flipping that completely, but we have to think about all the AI stuff as sketches. You know, a lot of people look at an AI image, especially some professionals who are very adverse to it. They say that it's it's just so much errors, so many errors, so many problems. But I think we have to think about AI like the sketch side. Like you're not supposed to take something literally from that side of things, but it's going to help you jot, jot down so many ideas. It's going to uh, give you that quantity that you're looking for when you're still searching for ideas. And then the detail and refining phase can now also be part of that AI phase too, right? Because if we have some ideas we like, we could use the AI to further push it towards what we want, um, change the programming, change the material, go through all those things completely on the AI side before we even begin the 3D and the modeling and the detailing. And all that has to be done within the domain of architecture by an architect, right? This is not just saying that anybody can take it and go run wild with it, but we have the skills and the, the background to be the backbone that drives this whole process. So it's still quite important, our, I believe, our role as architects. And uh, as we see, yeah, simple ideas like just getting optioneering from uh, you know certain needs that is required in architecture, this type of stuff happens all the time. And also you just take you know one finished design more or less, you could reapply and get different materials and different architecture out of it. And that's quite practical because we have a lot of uh, this type of work where we just need some remodeling, we need some material changes and material considerations as alternatives. So all these things are really helping us currently. And of course, further along, my specialization is in parametric design. So of course, I try to find how to marry that into AI. And one way is to tie it with the AI so that while you're manipulating the geometry, you're kind of getting a sense of the reality of it in real time. So that's quite useful. And perhaps there's other algorithms, for example, generative, uh, or this particular one is the ge genetic algorithm. So it operates like evolution, right? We have a whole bunch of permutations and then they get evaluated based on their performance on how much solar shading they're getting, uh, how much solar gain they get from the courtyard, and then the neighborhood view obstruction, and finally, uh, what else, uh, GFA maximization. 
So all these conflicting parameters can also be explored with AI to then maximize. And I'm talking about this is quantitative, right? All this is numerical and AI can take that data and just give you the best option by the end of that. And of course, then you hook it up back into the qualitative AI, back into the visualization and just get some quick ideas of what results you're getting out of good performance so that you're able to kind of push on the performance side while push on the visual side, which is what we do traditionally, but now it can all be tied together. Or we can see how to manage a footprint while seeing the whole thing come alive in 3D so that we can evaluate the uh, experiential side of things. So we believe that these are quite useful if all AI can do is just streamline all these processes for us together. And of course, finally, algorithms. Algorithms that can be helped with AI or any other. There's so many things that's unexplored, even in the computational side of things that we really enjoy doing, for example, university and such, but they really kind of go out the door more or less when you just go into your practice because there's so much things to explore with algorithms. And I think it's, it's not, we're not done, you know? So like, for example, bin packing, very simple. Uh, that particular one, you can hook it into AI as well and just see some of the permutations that come out of it. It's quite interesting. This particular exercise was also successful in the sense that it kept the context in place. We're not just randomly exploring different things. We put the correct context not only that, but the correct podium as well. And we're seeing how the kind of the upper geometry kind of engages with the podium. So our goal here in our studio, we have a research team, right? And we're just trying to really push AI towards the practical side of the application of architecture. And uh, there's quite a lot to think about. So ultimately, this is where I leave, leave you guys off. Um, my office, it's just one front, but really AI is very broad and we are really at the nascence of this technology. What I showcase is only my direction of what I explored in the last two years alone. And I believe it's like a very deep ocean and we're all just scratching the surface. As AI technology progresses and it's doing so faster than we can adapt, I think we have a lot of incentives to continue exploring, especially in the academia, especially in the industry, and now, especially in the creative industry, I think there's a lot of potential and we just have to understand our role as humans with AI so that we can co-pilot it and then co-create our futures together. Thank you very much for listening. Hello. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Tim? He's willing to take some. Okay, quite a few. Where where to start? Uh, first off, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a uh, really, really thrilling uh, talk to hear. Um, something I've been curious about with how rapidly these AI models have been advancing is it kind of seems like it might lower the barrier to entry a little bit. I mean, putting together renders, for example, uh, is a very time consuming uh, process and AI definitely can speed it up a lot. And there's definitely details in smaller elements that you can't do quite as effectively as if you made a render from scratch. But I'm kind of curious, mm. uh, and you talked about this a little bit and we're talking about mm. what a firm will look like, you know, years from now, um, or maybe just a couple months from now, who knows? Uh, <laughs> But um, what, what can you do to continue to, to add value um, when it seems like there's going to be a shift between what might have been really valuable before being able to maybe, you know, do a great 3D model and put together a render might not be as valuable when you can take a sketch and, and bring it to something you can show to a client kind of so much easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so very good question. I mean, we could actually look back in history and see some examples. I always go back to photography because it's a really great one. The invention of photography prior to that, sketching portraits was quite an important job, right? Painting was not your abstract endeavor for artistry, but for capturing real life, right? The moment photography was invented, well, uh, cameras were invented, 
all of a sudden realism no longer became a a human talent to try to pursue the machine can do it better oh so soulless these photographs you know they they don't understand the hard work that humans put into drawing something to realism but did artistry did art itself disappear after that it didn't right when photography was invented as its own domain art became something else it became it flourished as a sort of abstract expression it became further explored as a emotional and human expression while photography fulfilled the functional necessity of capturing real life and documentation so very much the same we have today a technology that will allow us to pursue how far and how effective we can push architecture and design but it's not going to get rid of the artistry that's all around us it's not going to do it for art it's not going to do it for photography and it's not going to do it for architecture because the human essence is the things that we can do with the technology the technology will always be given to us you know and, and the type of work that i've done so far I realized, you know, the first two weeks, for example, on Instagram, I'll give you a very practical example. First two weeks on Instagram, when a new AI technology comes up, everybody is on it and everybody is getting likes and views and clicks because it's interesting, it's novel, it's new. But guess what? It tapers off. It tapers off and then we get a few people who keep pushing that technology with their own artistry to then bring it further, which is why while this technology is open to everyone, the artists will take that tool and make the best case out of it, which is why I think with all these technologies, we what we see is actually the human behind the technology using it to its full advantage. So in the broader spectrum of things, just to generalize and say, yes, it's going to take away some of the elements that was revered as a talent, you could say, but it's not going to take away talent itself. We're just going to have to find where else is talent needed. When everybody can generate photorealistic uh, visuals very quickly, that no longer becomes the value we're looking for. It becomes how good the design is, what is your concept, what is your philosophy, how does it, how functional is it, how actually scalable and, and producible it is, and how architectonic works there, and everything else that I can keep listing that is within the domain of, you know, architectural values. And there is quite a lot. So I don't think we have anything to worry about as uh, architects. My my question is, um, and their the renderings are beautiful. They're incredible. Can the AI measure what the tensile strength is of some of these designs? I mean, some of the stuff it looks beautiful, but it looks like a top. You know, it looks like you, it's impossible to build. Can the a you know the AI was saying the rendering? Oh, the sun's here, and you got your geothermal this and that, and sun. You know, facts and figures and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but. How is this really executable? And can the AI, would you have to have 3D printers? I mean, I, I don't think some of this stuff is physically possible to build. But I'm not a skeptic. I wish it was. No, no, that's absolutely right. So I showcase a lot of the times concepts. Concepts, which is why I had that slide specifically to tell you guys that it's important to look at AI sketches as sketches like we don't look a hand sketch by frank gary and say oh i don't think this engineering works no it's it's the bigger picture like what's the expression we're bringing are we bringing the circulation over this area so that it cantilever so that it can engage with the public and you know whatever your story is behind that and ai as images bring you that in the form of sketches the only difference is that this sketch is hyper-realistic, which means we have to rewire our brain a little bit to think about them as sketches. Because, yes, traditionally, you would see this and be like, oh, the engineering looks soft, right? Because it's finally rendered by a render company, thousands of dollars for a couple of images. They probably got the engineering happen. But no, this thing is something that is done through text, done through all this creative process. And again, it's... It's a creative output from which then you can distill into architecture. And that's where we come in, in the roles of trying to bring these ideas to reality. 
And that's working hard with the architects, working hard with the engineers, working hard on site as well, and working hard to find the right materials. There's so many different things that we have to do to bring that to real life that it's really not about those images. It's about the process that comes after. So we cannot get fixed on that first image and expect too much. So we treat them as sketches. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. And welcome again to Catholic University. Thank you. Um, two related questions. When it comes to urban design, like we see in the in the really in the foreground, middle ground, and background of this one, what what are your models there? And then with regard to specific buildings, you talked about you gave examples of different architects whose names and and Ubers you could you know ask mm -hmm. to be like like unto right? Are there are there architects that whose work lends themselves to success? for what you're going for and those who don't. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Because I would think that in the world of ingredient approach, right? And I'm not trying to minimize this at all, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of, a, I would I want to begin here, Let's and let's go in this direction. Where, where are the most efficacious architects or architectures that for you produce the best results? And, and then don't forget about the urban design part, thanks. <laughs> Uh, well, this picture has been done a while ago. Frankly, I produce thousands of images per day. In general, urban design wise, I, I don't know. I mean, off the top of my head, honestly, sometimes I produce, I, I prompt more architects than I do urbanists, but, uh, like OMA comes to mind just because of their, their broad strokes and, uh, the way they play with, uh, heights and spaces uh but really i do explore everything and then i just put the word urban after and see how it goes sometimes it's really not that high level yeah yeah, yeah. i don't want to like mystify anything it's really just uh you throw in the the words that you think will work you test it out and if it gives you something cool then you move to that direction and when i say cool you know it can mean many things uh your second question I would like you to rephrase it a little. Are there architects whose names that you use as input? Uh, are, are there are there architects that who, whose input results in not so desirable or even more desirable work? We've seen a lot of your Zaha work, right? Uh, any anybody else? And we you showed a couple right. examples, but are there ones that are more difficult or ones that are just you know, nah, I'm not I'm not going there. I think. Uh, yeah, so I could broadly say like formalists approach architects, the ones that they're known for their stylistic forms that do like these one-off buildings like Baku Azerbaijan. Yeah, I mean, of course, those ones are easy for the machine to train because they have a very strong formalist stylistic approach, which the machine picks up as pixels and the relationships and how they work. And you are absolutely right that there are so many types of architects that have embedded values in their architecture that is not visual per se, that is more perhaps uh, the way the space is arranged and how it interacts uh, with uh, different programs and the public. So yeah, I mean, but in the end, you know, things can get quite visual, no matter how uh, profoundly successful an architect is there is a sort of a visual manifestation of that, right? If you say an architect produce a really beautiful space and engage with the public, then it's going to be visuals. You're going to see like the real life buildings and the photos of it that really does well and engage with the public. So then those photos will then be trained with the machine and you will produce similar results, at least visually, at least superficially. But it's okay because sometimes ideas start from the superficial and then we evolve from there. But uh, yes, architects that I don't touch, like Bibiskin is a hard one because it's just it's just too hard to reconcile that with anything else. And sorry, uh, that's a bit. I I don't I don't I, I don't only do contemporary, like very contemporary architects. I, otherwise, do classical. I just put like you know the generic terminologies. Um, if I say. Funny, one funny thing is I don't actually prompt Zaha Hadid that much. 
Yeah, a lot of the stuff that you see here, uh, if I prompt this Ahadid, it's going to get crazy really fast. And I think those of you that have tried AI have known. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, absolutely wild. And you're like, how how did he do Zahadid so so subtly? And mine is all over the place. It's, uh, most of the time, I don't use the word Zahadid even. Maybe I use the word Zaha because even shortening that will give it a little bit of it without going too far. But here I am just uh, uh, giving out the, the secrets, obviously. But it's all about describing the geometry. I don't always describe the architect. I describe the geometry. I describe the materiality, um, the type of uh, glass reinforced panels that we typically use. It usually gives you these catalog industrial uh, images that has already been built. Therefore, that database that you queried out will give you more realistic results. Because I know Zahadid, if you prompt, you don't only get Zahadid buildings. If you Google search Zahadid, you get furnitures, you'll get handbags, crazy shoe that she wears. Like all these things is going to the mix with architecture and you're going to get something that doesn't look like Zahadid architecture at all. But the mix of all the data that you get from the word Zahadid. So yeah, prompt crafting is a, it's definitely an art, I would say. And the more you do it, the more you realize there's certain things that you didn't expect and you slowly make your way towards uh, what you want, which is why I say people that uh, have done prompt crafting appreciate when they see a result because they know what it's been through in order to get it to that particular point. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, do you have any advice for us as students? Because already in architecture school, we're learning how to find our own artistry in our work. Now with the emerging and ever-changing world of AI, do you have any advice for how we can continue to find our artistry and our footing, especially in such a fast-changing world mm. and fast-changing technology? Yeah, I mean, for one is to embrace it, is to experiment with it. I think it's not just about AI. Uh, when I was in architecture school, you know, things like grasshopper, you know, parametric design, this stuff was kind of cutting edge, but our traditional teachers don't want you to touch it. Our cool teachers will teach you a little workshop there on the side, right? But really, it's about those things. It's about like what is introduced but hasn't been massively uh, adapted because the traditional architecture uh, industry will do things a certain way. And if you have those skill sets in the future, you will be employable for those type of things, which is the majority uh, until a certain point it's not. And so when these new technologies come beyond AI, beyond parametric design, you could talk about when AutoCAD was the first, the new kid on the block, you know, those things had to be adapted. And during those early phases, what's, what's your answer? How should we adapt to AutoCAD? You know, you just have to go for it. You explore all the potentials uh, you can do with it and project the possible future where a certain type of skill set is needed to use it. Today, I can project prompt engineering as something quite important. And this is not just echoed in, in design. This is echoed by people in all industries saying like ChatGPT, a large language models. Prompt engineering becomes a sort of a skill set of the future, right? It's like how we teach our kids today how to search on Google better. It's like that, but 10 times more effective. So how to prompt something out in the way that you expect and be effective with it, that's kind of like more closer to the type of skill sets you will need for engaging in a future where AI is going to dominate everything. And so your skill set in prompt engineering is going to go beyond just doing better images and better designs, but also it's going to prompt the robot to lift the brick better, to actually build it for you, or the drones to, to draw out and 3D scan the entire room before you're able to even analyze the site. I don't know, the, the future can get quite wild if we keep progressing uh, as we are right now. So I think just be open-minded. I can't tell you what to explore, what to not, because I'm trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. Uh, as a practitioner, how do you apply AI into the clients? Like, how do you reassure them that the building will be made in a structurally sound manner if it's all generated by the computer? Mm. This might be a good time, Tim, to talk about how you're starting to build real buildings next. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's a very good question. 
because I literally have to deal with that with the client all the time. Because right now with my office, we're actually getting big projects like government projects, getting big projects. That's all NDA. That's why I can't really show you guys any of that because I think by next year, my presentation is going to be a lot shinier <laughs> than it is today. But um, essentially, the clients that I'm dealing with right now are, of course, the one approach me because they are invested in this technology and they see the potential. But it's funny, it's not the client that I'm worried about. It's about the architect that works with the client. Now, they have a certain bit of distance in which we are trying to convince them. Even like what I show them, like the whole sketching thing, like you have to convince them that it's a sketching process. It's not a refinement process. You don't look at that and see that it's a finished product. And, you know, you just have to reframe your way of thinking. And not many people are capable of reframing. They would see something and they're like, oh, that doesn't work. This technology is crap, you know. So they dismiss it, sadly. And uh, you're just going to have to deal with those type of people. And also you're going to have to deal with overly eager people too, who's going to say, oh, this technology is going to be good for everything. Uh, let's design everything exactly as it is, which is a horrible idea. <laughs> so again, it's about the balance. I'm here, I guess, talking about co-piloting. I emphasize on the idea of co-creating, co-piloting. The role of the human is important. And the role of the AI is increasingly important. And we just have to learn to work on those two together. And so keep talking to your clients and making sure that they understand that that's the case and showcase it to them, you know, and start building things. Once it's built, you tell them, hey, look, the process of AI was involved there. And if you want to give a good figure, a good example, I can tell you right now, Zaha Hadid, Norman Foster, Heather Wick, they all have people there using AI. It's part of the process now. Completely. And they also do their talks. You, you don't have to listen to me. You can go listen to the directors talking about AI as well. Like they literally are all telling you that it is part of our design process because it's quite useful. So, you know, it's going to become so predominant everywhere. It's going to be common that I don't think clients are by then are actually going to question it because we're no longer the first people doing it. Everyone's doing it. But if you want to be the first, you have to be a little more brave. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Tim, and thank you for dedicating your time to us. Very, very nice lecture. Um, I've been teaching here for 20 years, uh, over 20 years, and I'm one of those people that you described coming from the past of, you know, modeling, rendering, post-production, parametric, and so on. Um, I think um, the key word and the fresh point of your lecture tonight for us, fresh user of AI, is in the connection you made with parametric. I think AI and parametric for the reason that, as you stated, AI can be very seductive, very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, still the idea of coolness, I use that word all the time because it has an inherent harmony that it's explainable. That's why we like it geometrically or fit to the site right. and et cetera. But go going further and deeper to that, um, I think the idea of parametric brings into AI uh, the uh, sort of insertion of data to which AI reacts, uh, which could be data that is so more true, if I can say, truer. Um, mm -hmm. or, or I wish there could be something beyond the geometry. There could be a cultural parametric or, or a conceptual parametric that goes beyond the, the reaction of a building to a set data uh, that is usually you know, either geographical or, or, or geometrical. So when you create these buildings, how responsible do you feel uh, for the amount of people that you are infecting? I've been following you on Instagram since a long time, so much before today. <laughs> so I I know that um, that, you know, you have a responsibility out there. And I think the stretch comes to the point to, like you said, insert Zaha as a name or or even the pine nuts, which could result in a much cheesier, tacky result of architecture, really not evocative, but like a copy or, or a, a too much of a resemblance, if I can say so. You still did it in a very kind of delicate way. But how responsible to, do you feel to the public that follows you? Um, in a way to teach them and give them a lesson on, you know, you gotta put in there 
a good question. And the good question is not a copy of a person or a copy of a style or a copy of somebody came before you, but something that has to do, for example, with landscape, sensitivity of other sort of stuff that we as human can do. I mean, do you feel that responsibility out there? Because I, I certainly know you have it. Yeah, of course, you know, being on the front line of uh, the on media side of AI is kind of funny role to take because <clears throat> I am a highly sort of analytical person when I approach technologies. So usually I'm on the back end of things. Like in Zaha Hadid, we researched design and technology and I liked, I preferred kind of being on the computer and sorting out, understanding the algorithms and parameter design and how to uh, apply that to certain things. I just applied that same approach the methodological approach towards AI and it gained a lot of success because the visual manifestations of those successes are quite uh, expressive and those things then get into the virality algorithm, we can say. And that kind of brings us to where we are today. It's not my intention to go viral for the sake of going viral or for designing in that certain way. Sometimes I wanted to express and find some of my own expressions through ar architectural means, but sometimes it's more so to showcase the technology. It's a combination of those things that kind of brought me to where I am. And of course, every time I'm talking about it, I'm showcasing the side that is not just the images. I'm showcasing the parametric design, the solar analysis, and how the quantitative data is going to take over the future of AI, which is where we should focus on. And that's why I'm trying to structure my you know, talks in such a way that it gives you a glimpse of how I structure and design with AI, but it's really about the application, uh, especially on the technical side. And that's for the future. That's for us to continuously explore. But yeah, as you say, for me, it's a, it's a very important role to, to try to showcase people the, the other side of AI, especially the size that, that is dealing with the actual reality of architecture, which is to better people's life if we can just put a umbrella term on it awesome. yeah. so, tim you've been so generous generous with your time and i know you're jet lagged do you have time for two very short more questions sure yeah more? okay then then, yeah. then we'll we'll let you yeah. let you free no i'm good <laughs> i just want to thank you for coming um just coming off the way because i know this was a problem last year with ai with chat gpt and almost academic uh integrity what's the line between because I've used AI precedent before on a maritime museum just to help visualize things I wanted to write out. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line between uh, almost that academic integrity coming up with your own idea, especially for design school, and using AI to help supplement and visualize ideas? Right. There it is. The copyright question. I Every uh, lecture, I was waiting for that one question. Yeah. And there is. I thought we were going to skip that one for, for once in my life, but <laughs> no. Of course, absolutely important subject to discuss because yes, the AI is scraping a huge amount of database from other people's works. But again, there's so many ways to interpret it, but I think we have to clarify the difference between copying something and learning from something. So look, if you take a student who is a painter and you tell a student to go to a Van Gogh museum, learn how Van Gogh does his style, does his strokes, does all that. And then tell the student to just draw something new out of that similar style. Now, does Van Gogh own the result of the student's work? You probably say not. The student has incorporated that into his endeavors or her endeavors and to do something inspired by that. And that student can also be inspired by multiple artists. Same thing with architecture and with AI. You can ins be inspired by multiple architects or just one. But the idea is the machine, the, the only difference between that and now is that the student is now a machine. It's a super student. It's able to learn hundreds of thousands of data and it's able to produce it to a lot more efficiency. But the way it learns is still learning. Machine learning is still learning. That's the underlying word here because what it is, is it's taking the pixels, understanding its relationship, and then kind of replicating that relationship again. For example, how we, for example, 
built in, we're hardwired to see golden ratio. It's beautiful to us. If we take something, we understand that this is a nice geometry or nice pattern, and then we do it somewhere else, we're not stealing that idea. We are getting inspired by it to do something transformative. So I think we shouldn't evaluate it based on the tool because it's a learning tool. We should evaluate it based on the results, which is what you do with the tool. Are you gonna do the tool? Are you gonna take the tool and be one of those AI copycat artists that does like 99% of the original content with a slight variation? Or are you gonna take that tool and just transformatively create something completely new out of it? You know, if artists like Kanye West can splice a, you know, traditional music or whatever in different ways to generate something new out of it, remixing, is that his work? Or is he just copying? So you can think about it that way. We're remixing, but in a visual sense, and then we're creating, generating completely new contents based off of it. There are other artists that, you know, actually collage this existing art into art, a new art. So I think even that's more uh, copying than the way AI does it. But uh, ultimately, for me, it's about the outcome. Uh, the onus is on the artist in the end, right? Or the architect. Uh, you evaluate it, whether this is a copycat of uh, the the Burj Khalifa or the Sydney Opera House, or it's something new. Sorry, sorry? That's another exactly that's a really good point. Yeah. Also, again, I, I almost forgot that point as well. That's a really good point. Because we're using it as a as a sketching tool to then refine and go through the entire architecture process. So that sketch is like what 10, 20% of your effort. And the rest is like you can't really uh put a copyright on all your entire architectural process. So I would say, yeah, that's another side of the coin. So Although if you do 20%, but then the 80% is something new, but then you still build this in the opera house, I think it still doesn't work, right? So it's also the concept. Okay. Yes, hi. Thank you so much. This has been very inspiring. And for me, I have been using architect uh, AI for both work and school, and it has been part of the process. Uh, but it's like you said, it's mostly uh, for inspiration, concept development, and things like that. Uh, the majority of the questions that I have have already been asked, but the one question I want to ask is, um, as architects of the future, how do we improve AI? It could be alongside engineers, it could be uh, experimenting with the tool that we already have, but just generally, how do we improve AI to better help architects, all of us in general? So I reckon that's a bit more of a technical question of how the AI itself can be improved to help us, right? There's that. Also, like generally, just how do we improve AI in terms of, because earlier uh, you mentioned that um, to get like the most accurate image that you're looking for, yeah. uh, typing in a prompt could be specific to the material. It could be specific to the geometry. Um, for me, when I was trying to figure out, um, when I was trying to produce different images, it didn't help to type in a lot of prompts. Uh, it helped to change different AIs here and there. And I actually ended up uh, merging a lot of different AIs to produce one image. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering uh, if, I mean, of course, there's a lot, a long way for AI to go. Hmm. Well, first when of all, I applaud you for already, you know, exploring different types of AI. That's exactly the type of process that uh, should push us to explore all the potentials. So yeah, we're still at the phase where we are, you know, at the tip of the iceberg and nobody even has climbed this iceberg. And uh, it's like, yeah, this tool is good for this. That tool is good for that. I can't tell you in the future which tool is going to take over, but I know the general direction of how it should improve. For example, AI rendering, I think it's going to be the first thing to really take off. Like the traditional rendering companies will probably be the first to need to restructure because we're going to have built-in AI renderer probably as a plugin in your viewport in whatever modeling software you have. And you just type in something on the side and just see that simultaneously while you're still modeling. How cool would that be? I think that's already very close 
And we have certain versions of that already. So I know some of you kind of say, yeah, it's already exists today. It's not that good, but it's going to get to a point where it's really good. Really good to a point where I think we don't need to spend thousands of dollars for, per image on a rendering company for once. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's one part of our industry that is going to change very rapidly. And the other part is using AI to formulate the tasks that you do in traditional architecture. Um, again, going back to the entire, you know, the spectrum of AI and how it's going to improve. There's that concept side. What we're using currently, mostly Midjourney, is giving us ideas like Pinterest and whatnot. That's going to improve and be easier to control. We're going to have the uh, control net type of AI that's going to render things for us and take our ideas and put it to real massing. Right now, you take a mid-journey image, you take that idea and you say, apply it to this massing and generate it. And that's already kind of like, you know, we can do it more or less, just not as good. And then, of course, you have the detail side. Uh, the construction, documentation, everything's linked with BIM, which we already have to an extent. But I think at, in the era of AI, the AI will not only learn to implement it, but learn to fix it, learn to fix all the processes so that it's actually streamlined. The problem is we always, we always get clunky when we have different specializations. So our human profession is partitioned based on our professions. But in the future, AI should take over the entire streamlined process in which our specialization will be the partition part to take over and guide the AI. So it's like a single pipeline. We're all like pipe workers. We're just trying to improve it so that make sure that everything speeds along the process. Data goes in, goes out. Someone draws a sketch. All of a sudden, we have documentation in one day. Like That's possible. And I think that's where it's going. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hey, Thank everybody you. give my hand. Thank you. Thank you. There were a lot more questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get everybody, but remember, he has to save his voice because there's a student only, sorry, friends, there's a student only workshop tomorrow that he's leading from 11 to 1230 in Lowcraft. So if you're a student here at Catholic University, please show up and bring those unresolved questions. So thank you again very much. Come on, another round. Thank you. Ready.